I, I haven't started yet. <coughs> um, so uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm the only one in this category, but I've actually done this before. I gave one of the, one of the colloquia here, um, I think in the first year of operation of APS, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be back on this, uh, this stage again. Um, everybody can hear me okay. Uh, up in the balcony, in the, uh, yeah. You can see the Mets game, can you, from up there? <clears throat> I'm going to be on, the, um, on my flight home during the game, so I'm expecting to get updates on the, uh, uh, on the progress as we, as we go along. Okay, so to business here. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to tell you about is, uh, is uh, how we get structure using X-ray diffraction in a fairly general way, because I'm not just talking to uh, scientists here, but uh, to uh, uh, the general, general interest uh, audience, including the people on the television over there, apparently. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'll advertise strongly this method of Bragg coherent uh, X-ray diffraction, which we've developed here. Um, and it continues to develop, and it will continue to develop further with uh, future upgrades and so forth. So part of the message here is the kind of thing that you can study with it and uh, where, where it's going to be, uh, uh, going to be heading. Um, I'm also going to talk about dynamics. That part of the work was not done here. That was uh, uh, the uh, first experiment we were able to do at the uh, LCLS facility at Stanford, which is an X-ray free electron laser. Um, I won't, I won't say very much about the facility side of things, but just talk about how our RAG CDI method is, uh, is very effective uh, with, that, uh, with that ultra-fast capability. The other beam lines that I'm going to be showing work from are two beam lines from Diamond, uh, shown here, and also the uh, uh, mainstay of the, of, the, of the method, which is the 34IDC uh, beam line here. The people that... Um, I've worked with directly on this work. Other people will be mentioned as, uh, as, as we move along. Um, our Jesse Clark, who was a, a postdoc with me for four years, um, and <clears throat> he developed a lot of the uh, software methods for analyzing the data. And I'm very happy to hear that his programs are in wide circulation now. So uh, many people um, here are, are using those programs for, for, for different things. So he's contributed greatly to the field uh, by doing that. Ross, you probably all know, he's probably here, I haven't seen him, but uh, um, uh, he, he's in charge of the, uh, uh, of the beam line and uh, continues to advance the, uh, the methods uh, uh, there. Johannes Ely um, is a, a, a student who worked with us uh, that Jesse uh, uh, worked with particularly well, um, and two of the experiments they did together are, are things that I'm going to talk about. And uh, Anna is a, a student of mine from, um, uh, from UCL who uh, uh, has got some really interesting results. And I've put them in the talk because we don't actually fully understand them yet, but uh, anybody who's got uh, a creative mind might be able to help us with the uh, interpretation there. So the things that I'm going to try to cover are the, uh, uh, the issues about why we study nanocrystals and why nanocrystals are interesting. Um, and the method of coherent X-ray diffraction that we've developed for, uh, for looking at these. The um, technical message we'll, we'll get to is that we're able to image uh, strains uh, uniquely uh, using this method, and we Im image them as a, a complex density function. So I'll have to explain that when we, uh, when we get there. And I'll show a few examples. One of them is imaging of dislocations inside crystals using the method. Um, which is uh, quite new work, and uh, that was the work of uh, Johannes, actually. And then the nanoscale alloying work, which is Anna's project, and that's uh, also new results, but uh, not fully understood yet. And then, last but not least, the ability to look at dynamics by taking this method into the time domain and looking at, uh, looking at uh, uh, things moving with... Uh, with the stroboscopic methods of having a, having a snapshot image taken with an X-ray free electron laser. Okay, so I wanted to um, <coughs> introduce uh, this fellow. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the first to, uh, to, to mention Bragg. Uh, it's in the title of my talk, and uh, uh, I think many of, many of you know the story of Bragg. 
Um, this was him about the time he won the Nobel Prize. He was the youngest ever Nobel Prize winner. This is Lawrence Bragg, son of Henry Bragg, who was the uh, also famous father who also won the Nobel Prize. Um, what's interesting about this was his uh, most important paper. This was written when he was a student. And because he was a student, when the work was presented to the Cambridge Philosophical Society, um, he wasn't allowed to give the talk because he was just the student. And uh, uh, the talk was given by J.J. Thompson, who was his uh, advisor, I suppose. And, um, well, the results uh, stand for themselves. It's a beautiful uh, paper that explained the experiments done a year before by von Lauer uh, that saw diffraction from crystals for the first time. And von Lauer had a, had a fairly complicated explanation for what was going on, and Bragg's was, was much simpler and rapidly caught on. And within a few years, uh, uh, Bragg, father and son, were running a little business of solving all the, all the crystal structures uh, uh, known to man. Uh, <clears throat> so um, this is the essence of, uh, of Bragg's law that is the, uh, the thing to remember about Bragg. Um, uh, the idea that Bragg had, and he, according to the historical stories that, that were abundant a couple of years ago, because it was the 100th anniversary of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the science, um, <clears throat> were that uh, it, it was believed that uh, crystals were made up of atoms arranged in regular arrays. And uh, the picture of atoms and the size of them and so forth was not uh, terribly well known before the uh, before the uh, use of X-ray diffraction methods. But Bragg had the idea that you could think about the atoms as lying in these planes, which are now called the Bragg planes, and that the X-rays bounce off these planes, and because of simple wave optics ideas, there are only certain angles when the waves bounce off the planes and stay in phase with each other. And when they stay in phase, the despacing or the separation of the planes um, satisfies Bragg's law that the wavelength is related to the sine of the angle uh, through this uh, standard equation. And whenever you have the waves bouncing off at some other direction, then the waves get out of phase with each other and you get cancellation and you don't see a signal. So this explains the observation that's summarized here in the, in the paper that the diffraction only comes out at very discrete uh, uh, directions called Bragg spots. Okay, well, there's a, a long history of, of the solving of the structure of matter that's happened since then, but I think this is probably the, the most important uh, example of that. And, and this is the, uh, the structure of DNA that was determined from data taken by Rosalind Franklin at King's College in, in London. And it, it's been celebrated in lots and lots of ways, but my favorite is the, uh, the there was a, uh, a play that, 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 was, that appeared on stage uh, in London last year, and I think has already come to Broadway and making the rounds. And uh, this, uh, this is Nicole Kidman, who was the actress in it, and she did a wonderful job playing Rosalind Franklin, and I uh, really enjoyed that and really recommend it. But anyway, the, the story all boils down to the collection. Uh, it's the story about how uh, her group um, and her work in particular uh, was able to obtain this diffraction pattern of a, a well-aligned sample of DNA. So having a lot of strands of DNA carefully prepared and, and carefully handled, uh, she was able to get this uh, so-called photograph 51, which was, uh, 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 which, which was the key to the solution of the structure of, uh, uh, of, of DNA. And the thing that's remarkable about this, and I'll tell you uh, the features in this pattern and how you can tell uh, everything about the structure of DNA from it, um, the, the, the information content is, is uh, if you download it from Wikipedia, it's 19 kilobytes. So it's a trivial amount of data, but enclosed in, in, enclosed in all that uh, uh, very important diffraction pattern is, uh, are a number of very key uh, facts that tell you what is the structure of DNA, which we all know as this uh, double helix. So the, <coughs> the, the key steps are that the, uh, the uh, layer lines here, the individual uh, diffraction lines that appear, they come from the repeat of the d DNA double helix, and that's uh, um, uh, 34 angstroms uh, of, of distance along the helix uh, that gets repeated to make up this uh, structure. And the 
the base pairs, which are the key to the coding of genetic information inside the DNA, they are separated by 3.4 angstroms, and that spacing appears as this big uh, blob up here. And this is on the axis because it's aligned with the direction of the stacking of the, uh, of the base pairs. But the striation, the, the diagonal appearance of these uh, spots comes from the fact that it's, uh, it's a, a helical structure. And that was something figured out by Rosalind herself and by uh, Francis Crick. Um, so the number of spots is exactly 10. There are 10 of these intermediate spots before you get to the big end spot from the diffraction from the base pairs. That corresponds to the number of base pairs per turn of the, uh, of the helix. But the key to the interpretation of this diffraction pattern that was done by uh, Watson and Crick when they built their model of DNA uh, uh, using, using the data from Russell and Franklin was this missing spot up here. Um, and if you count up, it's the fourth spot which is missing. And the fact that the fourth spot is missing uh, with the training of, of crystallography tells you that you have a double-stranded helix with the two strands running in opposite directions. And that uh, uh, symmetry of the structure, which is directly attributed to this missing spot, is what allows this uh, uh, anti-codon uh, kind of, uh, or uh, the, the a reciprocal base pairing that takes place that, that gives uh, DNA its, uh, its very special role in biology. Okay, so, so that I think is a well-known story. This one is not so well-known and it's much more relevant to what we're doing with the Bragg CDI. So I'm going to t tell you about this. This was another uh, uh, invention of Bragg's uh, a little bit later than the uh, original uh, discovery of Bragg's law and the determination of all the uh, early crystal structures. Um, and that was the idea that the x-rays that are used to uh, measure these crystal structures have to match the size of the spacing of the atoms inside the, uh, the crystal. So it's a sort of angstrom uh, wavelength that uh, the x-rays have in order to uh, uh, achieve this goal. And Bragg uh, realized that, that by a factor of a thousand, visible light could be used to, uh, to, to create diffraction patterns as well. And so he had the idea that if you record the pattern using x-rays with, say, one angstrom uh, wavelength, and then you play it back using a thousand times bigger uh, light, which would be visible light, then you could get a, a magnified image of the, uh, um, of the, uh, uh, of the material. And uh, it was much easier to do diffraction experiments with light than it, uh, than it was with x-rays. And so the way he did it was you, he measured uh, for this mineral here, diopside, he measured the diffraction pattern, just one plane of the diffraction using one of the standard camera methods, um, and then went to the machine shop and told the machinist to drill a, a plate with the same pattern of spots in it and uh, different sized holes according to the different uh, structure factors that were uh, measured on the plate, and then you stick this plate into a, uh, into a lens-based uh, projection system, and you can, you can Fourier transform that uh, image optically and get an image of the, uh, uh, of the material. And the image that came out is shown over here and was published in the Nature paper here. Um, and this um, ignores one small thing, which is that the phase of each of these diffraction spots is missing and is not recorded by the film and is not copied into the machined uh, plate that's stuck into the microscope. So that information is missing, and that gives two copies of the structure, uh, which are, uh, so in fact, it's a, it's a correlation function or a Patterson function uh, of the structure instead of the real structure itself. But by looking at uh, a mineral with one heavy atom, calcium, and a lot of light atoms, it has a sort of self-imaging property where the heavy atom appears at the corner of the unit cell, and all of the correlations look like an image of the, of the structure itself. So this, this is, the, uh, this is the, the, the electron density map, and it looks very similar to the Patterson function because it's got this, uh, this single heavy atom in the corner. Um, that's a... Uh, 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 an alternative way of saying that all of the phases of the diffraction spots here are zero. So it's a, it's a fairly easy uh, problem to, uh, uh, to work on. Anyway, so the idea of using x-rays to make a microscope has continued, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, x-ray microscopes uh, developed, and I'll show you the one that we use in, in, in just a second. But I'm now going to switch subject and talk about nano, nanomaterials. 
And the first thing I want to say here is that nanomaterials are everywhere around us. Every time you mix uh, two chemicals together, especially if you do it in the presence of a surfactant of some kind, you get small crystals or small particles of product uh, of the reaction. And if you learn to do it carefully, you can then make arrays of these particles and handle them in interesting, interesting ways and get, uh, get crystals of the particles uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you would like to. Um, from a physicist's uh, side, uh, nanomaterials have uh, different properties from bulk materials. And uh, one way to look at this is to think of it as a kind of phase diagram where the, uh, the normal axes would be temperature and pressure for a material. Here we're plotting versus temperature and size. So if we look at smaller and smaller particles of, of gold, as in this picture here, then on the right-hand side, the large ones are cubic crystals up to the melting point and then, and then liquid above that point. But if you make them smaller, you get other unusual structures. And the first one that appears is a decahedral structure, and the second one is an icosahedral structure. These have five-fold rotation axes in them, which don't allow long-range uh, translational symmetry of the crystal, and so they are only possible for nanocrystals. And the decahedral one comes in first, and then the icosahedral one. But it also shows something which is still not really understood, and that is that when you uh, heat up one of these small particles, it doesn't just melt the way uh, uh, ice melts to water. It melts uh, in a more complicated way, which is uh, still not really understood. And so that's why these boundaries here are a little bit dashed, is because it's not very easy to measure exactly what's happening. So there's a gradual change between solid and liquid that takes place where fluctuations start to play a bigger and bigger role. And this is an area where we're still hoping to, uh, to use some of the tools available here at Argonne to, uh, uh, to study these. And at the end of my talk today, I'll talk about this uh, quasi-molten state uh, a little bit more. I usually like to take questions, but it doesn't work in this big room, so we'll, we'll just keep, keep that for the end. Okay, so this is the first experiment I'll talk about. This is uh, a work, of, um, work done in the Mittermeier group in, in Stuttgart, and it's a very simple uh, evaluation of the, prop of the different properties of a nanomaterial compared with a bulk material. So what they've, uh, what they've done here is they've taken a powder of particles and varied the size of the particles by an annealing method. Um, and what's plotted here is the two things that you can measure from an X-ray powder diffraction experiment. You can measure the uh, size of the particles from the line width, and you can measure the lattice constant from the angle of the diffraction through Bragg's law. And so what's plotted here is the, the, the large ones are on the top here with the uh, deviation from the bulk lattice constant at zero. And as you make the particles smaller and smaller, you get a deviation of the lattice constant uh, from, from the uh, bulk lattice constant. And it's a small but clearly measurable uh, difference of, uh, of the property. So the smaller particles have a smaller lattice constant. The atoms are, are closer together. And you can see plotted as a 1 over d uh, uh, axis, you can see that you get a nice straight line behavior here. And the straight line is ex explained by this equation here, which is uh, um, fairly simple. It says that the change in lattice constant is proportional to 1 over d. And the two things that come into the equation are surface stress and the, uh, the compressibility of the material. And the physics behind this is that the surface stress is imagined to, uh, if, if the particle is spherical and you have a surface stress on the surface, it's like a soap bubble. It's got a pressure difference between the inside and the outside, keeping the, the bubble uh, the size that it's, uh, that it's at. And there's a simple uh, relationship between the radius of the bubble and the surface stress, which is uh, uh, the Gibbs-Thompson uh, equation. And it's just basically uh, the, this, uh, this result here. So that the, the surface stress divided by the radius gives the, uh, um, gives the pressure. And then when you divide by the, uh, by the uh, bulk modulus, you get the, uh, the change in the, in the lattice constant. And the surface stress that comes out is, a, is a, a quantity that's familiar from surface science experiments to be two newtons per meter. So that's the, uh, as it were, the surface tension in the uh, in the metal that is making up these uh, nanoparticles. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so now if we look at slightly bigger particles, we're going to have, and it's known that we get uh, shapes that, uh, um, that, that would uh, correspond to the, roughly to the equilibrium crystal shape. Um, this picture, I see Don in the audience there. This is from Don's thesis. Um, so go ask him about it if you would like further information. Um, <clears throat> the equilibrium crystal shape construction is a way of converting the surface energy which changes with direction inside a crystal uh, into the, uh, the shape of the crystal that gives the, the, the least amount of total surface energy uh, integrated up over the, uh, over the surface of the, of the crystal. And it's usually made up of flat regions along the low index directions and curved regions that are uh, intrinsically rough over the, uh, over the rest of the surface. So you end up with a, a faceted structure with curved regions in between. So if you then say, well, what will the Gibbs-Thompson effect do to that? Then you come up with this picture where the flat regions are going to have a certain surface tension, but it's not going to, to change the structure. But the curved regions are going to have a pressure difference across them. And uh, because there's a pressure difference due to the Gibbs-Thompson effect, there will be a, a contraction of the crystal at the corners. So this is something to look for in the structure of the crystal, that we will have curved corners with strain associated with them, and then flat regions uh, uh, elsewhere. <clears throat> okay, now to the method that we use. This is down at uh, uh, sector 34. First thing we have to do to do a coherent diffraction experiment is throw away most of the beam. Um, the, uh, one of the strongest reasons for upgrading the APS in the uh, coming years is that the coherent fraction of x-rays in the hard x-ray range is, is, is a few percent, uh, maybe 1%, maybe 5% or so, depending on the, on the energy. And if we want to use the coherence of the beam, we need to throw away all the other 95% of the photons, and so we put in an aperture, um, make a, a, a small beam with uh, less flux in it, but with the property that the beam is uh, coherent. And we can still, once we've done that, we can still focus the beam down to go onto a single small particle. And our record so far is about 100 nanometers as the smallest size uh, particle that we can look at. Although um, Ross hopes that this will go to, down to uh, uh, even smaller particle sizes with, uh, with the advantage of the, uh, of the upgrade that we're, uh, we're planning. Um, <clears throat> So um, all we do in our experiment here is just measure the diffraction pattern just the same way that Bragg did in, in uh, uh, 1913. Um, but the difference is that because the beam is coherent, instead of just seeing a single spot coming from the direction of the Bragg planes that are inside the crystal, we will see uh, interferences from all of the extremities of the crystal. So we'll get uh, a set of fringes that will appear. There will be a diffraction pattern within the Bragg spot that will uh, represent the shape of the crystal. And that will be detected if we put a detector far enough away to be able to, to measure the, the positions of all of those fringes. So this shows how it works in practice. If you have a powder of small particles, you shine the beam on those, you get a, a powder diffraction ring, but the ring is broken up into individual spots that correspond to the, uh, to the individual crystals that you're hitting at the particular angle that bounces off at the detector position. But because the beam is coherent, every one of these spots has got a different set of fringes around it, and those fringes are coming from the coherent properties of the x-rays and the finite size of the, of the crystal. And sometimes they land on top of each other, and you, you can't measure individual crystals, and you just ignore those and go on to one that's freestanding and, uh, and measure that one. So it's a, it's a fairly handy method for, for looking at nanoscale powders. <clears throat> And without giving a long story, but this is quite a big subject, and this is where Jesse Clark's uh, contributions came in, um, we've come up with algorithms for inverting these diffraction patterns using the fact that the, um, <coughs> the uh, can't really see it very well here, but you'll see it a little bit later, but the number of pixels inside the pattern is at least two times greater than the spacing of the fringes. And that's a condition for the mathematical problem to be overdetermined so that it can be inverted. And the method that's been developed is based on Fourier transforms back and forth, where the information in the diffraction pattern is just simply the 
assertion of the measured values of the intensity without the phases because the phases are not known. And then in real space, the, the information is put in by saying that we know that the object uh, fits inside a small volume of space, which we call the support. And so we apply a support on every iteration, run the algorithm, and if the data are good enough and the problem is well, um, well chosen, then we'll get, a, we'll get an image. So we'll be able to convert this coherent diffraction pattern into an image of the crystal, inverting the Fourier transform and solving the phase problem that Bragg's microscope was uh, attempting to do um, in, the, uh, in, in the example I showed earlier. So here it is in practice. This is a, a three-dimensional diffraction pattern. This is a 1-1-1 one, one, one Bragg peak of gold. And to get the third dimension, we're rocking the crystal through the Bragg condition. So we're changing the angle of the crystal and playing it as a movie to show the third dimension. So we get two dimensions of diffraction information and a third one from the, from the angle. So that three-dimensional diffraction pattern of the crystal has got a lot of rings in it. Those come from the, the round parts of the crystal and a lot of flares, which come from the facets, the, the flat parts of the crystal. And when you invert it, you get, uh, it, in this case, you get an octahedral crystal. This is a gold crystal that has an octahedral shape but has rounded corners um, due to this equilibrium crystal shape uh, behavior that, uh, that I mentioned briefly that Don will tell you more about if you ask him. And the shaded box here is the, is the support that, uh, uh, that, that was used for the calculation because with very good data, you don't need a very, uh, very well-defined support for this to work. Now, the new information comes from the fact that it's also sensitive to the strain inside the crystal. And this is why I mentioned that the corners of the crystal should have strain associated with them. And you can see it here. The, uh, this, has been, this is just the surface of the crystal, but it's been colored according to the phase of the image that comes out. And the phase of the image, as I'll show in a moment, is a projection of the, uh, of the displacement field of the crystal uh, at every point in space. And you can see, I think, quite clearly that the, uh, the, the colored regions follow the edges of the crystal where we expected the strain to be. And the reason why that happens goes all the way back to Bragg's law again, that uh, when we look at the, uh, at the change of, of phase of a wave that is bouncing off the lattice points inside a crystal, if we move part of the crystal by, this, by shifting this blue block of atoms or lattice points, um, it, it, by this vector u, then we change the phase of the wave coming off that uh, intersection there relative to the starting position by an amount given by this two red pieces here, and you add those up and you get a very simple equation that tells you that the phase shift, which is what you see in that image, um, is just equal to the, uh, the difference of the two momentum vectors, which is called the q vector in diffraction, projected onto this displacement field. So we get a a projection view of the displacements that are present inside the crystal uh, appearing in the image. <clears throat> OK, so now I'm going to uh, show some of the, the new results that we've got with this in the, in the last uh, uh, couple of years or so. And um, this one is a movie, so I need to <clears throat> find my cursor. <clears throat> Just saw it. There. <clears throat> um, OK, so this is a three-dimensional image. This time it's a calcite crystal. Uh, it's been shaded out uh, to, to emphasize the fact that it's got these defects in it. And the defects are, are screw dislocations, um, which have been highlighted by the fact that at the center of the screw dislocation, there is a line of missing density, where the density goes to uh, some low value, and you can, you can threshold that value and then draw a circle around it, and then color the circle according to the phase of the material surrounding the dislocation. And if you look carefully, you, uh, I didn't say it yet, but the color scale here is going from blue around to red, corresponding from, to 0 to 2 pi. So it's one, one lattice constant change of the uh, position of the atoms in this displacement field. And that's exactly the property that you expect of a, of a screw dislocation. And you can see in this, uh, in this uh, picture here, um, that, uh, that there are three of them following uh, different directions along the, uh, uh, along, uh, the edges of the, uh, of the crystal. 
And what uh, Jesse and Johannes were able to do was to uh, follow the growth of this crystal while, while it was growing from solution on the beamline in, in an in-situ cell. So they could actually see uh, the data at different uh, time points. And uh, this shows the beginning, and then this is a later time. It looks like the, the pattern has shrunk, but it, and it has indeed shrunk, but it's grown much more intense, and it's just been rescaled to, uh, uh, to compare it with the, uh, with the earlier ones. So the diffraction pattern is contracting as the crystal is growing in size, and then you reverse the process and start uh, dissolving it again, and the crystal gets bigger again and, uh, and, and uh, less, less well-ordered. And these are three different uh, views of the three-dimensional diffraction pattern. And when you invert them, you get three views of the pattern of the, uh, of the uh, dislocations that are present inside the crystal. And you can see that they, they, uh, uh, they, they uh, fo follow the growth of the crystal in, in, a, in an interesting way here. Um, you can also look at the structure of the dislocation by zooming in and looking around that circle. So there's this nodal line down the center of the dislocation. If you follow around and plot the phase versus the angle around the dislocation, it, it forms a, a simple straight line. And that's the classical picture of a, of a screw dislocation where it's like a, uh, like a parking ramp where the, uh, where the height changes linearly with the uh, angle around the, uh, around the uh, dislocation line down the center. So they, they, we had a second experiment uh, that was uh, uh, published earlier this year where they were looking a bit more carefully at the, uh, at, the, at the kind of crystal shapes that were occurring for the calcite. This time it was grown on a self-assembled monolayer on a gold uh, surface. And these are SEM pictures showing a very reproducible uh, morphology of the crystal that forms. And there's a very unusual crystallographic direction, which is the growth direction. And these three facets here, which occur asymmetrically, are 104 uh, facets. But you get reproducible uh, copies of this particular morphology on, on this particular uh, substrate. Um, and you can image those with the uh, BCDI, and we can look at the shapes, and we get, of course, the uh, same shapes that you see in the SEM. But we can also look at the uh, of the disorder inside those materials. And what we find very characteristically is on each of the examples, we find a couple of dimples at the back. And if you look inside the crystal, there is a nodal line which is following around from one dimple to the other, which is a, uh, a different kind of, of dislocation. This is an edge dislocation. And if you um, look at the next slide, we've got a, a movie version of that. So this is one of these little unusual crystal shapes that grows on this particular substrate of uh, calcite. And you can see that there's a strong phase loop associated with those little dimples on the back and a, and a threading dislocation that connects them up. And this is a characteristic of why it grows on that particular face, this particular kind of, of dislocation. So we got some, uh, some understanding of that. And the structure of the dislocation itself is, uh, uh, is, is shown here. So this is just a it's a calculation you can do in a single line of, of MATLAB um, because it's a, it's, a, it's a very simple analytical form for the, uh, for the displacement field associated with a, a, a dislocation. And you can, um, you can uh, uh, calculate, so, so there's a dislocation line here, a dislocation line here. They're connected out of the plane of the screen by a, by a loop running around and it corresponds to the insertion of one plane of atoms between these two dislocations. And this is a dislocation loop. The uh, atoms on this side of the, of the crystal are displaced to the right. The atoms on this side are displaced to the left. So these get a positive component of their phase when projected onto the Q vector. These get a negative component, and you get this red-blue pattern of color that is associated with the, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the dislocation structure. Okay, I'm now going to say a little bit um, ab about the, um, the things I'm trying to do now that I've moved to Brookhaven. Um, we've got a, um, a quite large department with a lot of activity looking at uh, correlated electron materials. And these are famous for uh, a number of uh, important uh, uh, physical phenomena, such as uh, uh, high temperature superconductivity, uh, uh, spin density waves, and charge density waves. And the one that I'm going to look at uh, 
uh, more closely is, is, the, is the one on the right here, which is uh, one of the compounds important for colossal magnetoresistance properties. And it has this uh, very interesting pattern of, uh, which is called orbital ordering associated with the manganese that's uh, present uh, in, in the material. So if you look at one plane of atoms inside the crystal, um, it's got a composition where you uh, vary the concentration, you, you can dope the material by varying the concentration of electrons using the 2 plus versus 3 plus uh, valency of the lanthanum and the calcium. And the one we're looking at is a 50-50 mixture where these are randomly uh, uh, present in the, in the crystal lattice. And the result is that we get a half electron uh, uh, compensating on the, on the manganese. So half of the manganese are 3 plus and half of the manganese are in a 4 plus state. And what you get is a, a charge ordering of the material where the 3 pluses and 4 pluses segregate out in this uh, pattern here. And one of them has got a, a d orbital, which has got this uh, uh, a dumbbell shape, and those line up in a pattern which gives an even bigger unit cell of symmetry. And there's also, in addition, uh, spin ordering that occurs with, again, a different symmetry. So each of these different kinds of ordering, the charge ordering, the magnetic ordering, and the spin ordering, have got different uh, crystal structures, and so you get different Bragg peaks that each of those is able to detect. And we haven't done it yet, but we're going to look at each of those and look at the, uh, look at the uh, domain structures of these, uh, of these structures inside the uh, material. And the reason we haven't done it yet is that it's all below room temperature where, where these things happen, and we haven't yet got a cryostat on the, on the beam line to do this, but we're, we're working on it. Okay, other people have had cryostats, and so there's been a couple of earlier experiments that show um, the presence of speckle in these kind of uh, systems. So this is looking, um, I think, at charge ordering. Uh, this one is charge, or sorry, this is orbital ordering. This one is charge ordering. And you can see different, by looking at different Bragg peaks, you get different amounts of, of, uh, uh, of disorder present in, the, uh, in, in these uh, uh, different peaks when you use a coherent beam. And the goal would be to take the distribution of speckles here and invert it using our uh, algorithms and, and get images. <clears throat> now, it's uh, difficult to do in the case here because here we're just using a, uh, a pinhole to define the beam and the, the structure of the beam on the surface of the crystal is very complicated and it, uh, uh, it, it hasn't worked so far to just take those patterns and invert them using, using these methods. But what we do instead is make small crystals, nanoparticles of this material. And this is a LCMO nanocrystal material. And they're clumped together in these little uh, pellets, which are a few microns in size. But you can see that each of the little balls, which is a nanocrystal of LCMO, uh, is about half a, half a micron or so across. And so by coming in with the beam, we can pick out one of these and measure its diffraction pattern and then invert it and get an image of the uh, of, of the internal structure of that, uh, of that uh, uh, crystal. So this shows the same kind of data that was got on those earlier papers, but now taken from a, uh, a nanocrystal of the material, and you can see the, uh, the distribution of, of speckles that is surrounding the peak. We divide them into two categories. This one has got a single center, and that one is relatively easy to invert, it turns out. This one's got multiple centers where there's several bright speckles all around. These are still difficult to invert, so we're only part way towards being able to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, understand what's going on through images uh, of, uh, of these materials. And I wanted to make a very simple point about these speckle kind of diffraction patterns, because what, uh, what we think they come from is some sort of uh, heterogeneity inside the sample. So if the real space image consists of a set of domains that are, uh, let's say, randomly positioned in space, and we put a beam of this size onto them, then we will get interference between all of those patterns and we will get one of these uh, speckled patterns. But uh, there are some constraints on the diffraction pattern that come from this construction here. So one of them is that each domain, the reciprocal of its size will give the size of the uh, of the entire diffraction pattern, which is this outer circle here. And the reciprocal of the beam size gives you the speckle size. And if you take the ratio of the speckle size to the, to the cluster size, 
it's the same as the ratio of the domain to the beam size. So if we look at one of these patterns, we can just read off by counting how many domains there are in the illuminated part of the uh, material. So if we're looking at a half micron crystal, then we know that since we're seeing about 20 domains, uh, about 20 speckles, we can say uh, square root of 20 uh, times half a micron is about a couple of hundred nanometers for the size of the, uh, for the domains. And when we invert the diffraction pattern, that's what we see. So this is, this is an image of, the, uh, of one of those nodules, one of those nanocrystals of LCMO that's been obtained from the, from the data that I just showed you, a three-dimensional diffraction pattern. And what we find is a quite interesting and quite rich pattern of structure inside the crystal. So there are these what we call phase domains where the crystal is shifted by different amounts in different places and forms a sort of texture all within the, within the half micron sized block of, uh, of LCMO that we're looking at. And the size of the domains is about 100 nanometers or so. And there, it's quite a, quite a rich uh, picture. Um, in fact, it's best to see it in three dimensions, which hopefully this will do. So this is a movie cutting through the three-dimensional distribution of these domains, and you can see the, uh, the complexity of this three-dimensional uh, pattern of phase offset structures that appears inside this material. We don't know if this is important or not, we just know that it happens for the particular sample that we, we, were, uh, we were looking at. So this, this work will continue, um, and will keep uh, 34 IDC busy for, for a few more years probably. Okay, so the, the, um, uh, the next problem I'm going to talk about is the, um, is the work of Anna. She's been looking at uh, gold nanocrystals, uh, which she's depositing iron on top of. And this is also work in progress. It's not, uh, not finished, and we still don't understand the results. But we've got some nice pictures to show. Here is an elongated gold crystal, um, about 400 nanometers long. And this is one of the ones that she did the in-situ experiment and evaporated uh, iron on top of to look at the alloying of the gold and the iron. And you can see in a cross-section of, uh, of the crystal how it changes with time. And what happens is that immediately after you dose at 400 degrees, the, the, uh, the density responds and then doesn't change uh, anymore. When you put a second dose on, it changes again and then doesn't change anymore. So there's an immediate equilibrium set up between the iron coming down and the, uh, and the gold uh, that's uh, the starting material. If you look at the phase, this is the part we don't understand. The Q vector is down here. The phase is all negative, so we get a, a negative distortion which gets bigger with distance from the center of the crystal. And if you look at, um, you can see it best uh, down here, if you look around the, uh, looking down the Q vector, which is this view here, all of the crystal is shifted in the same direction on the outside, and that's something we don't really understand very well. So we get an interesting strain pattern. What is probably happening is that there is a concentration gradient of iron from the center to the outside of the crystal, which is coupling through, um, let me go forward to here, coupling through misfit dislocations to give rise to a pattern of strain. But we, the details we still have to, uh, still have to work out. Okay, I, I was uh, being a bit quick because I did want to save time to talk about the time domain experiments. And these, uh, these were a big collaboration that went to LCLS a few years ago. And what we did was we put one of the gold crystals into this X-ray free electron laser beam and then hit it with a, a laser where we could adjust the power level um, and then look a short time later with a single shot of X-rays and get a diffraction pattern out. And repeating that over and over again for different time delays, we could see, this is showing the position of the Bragg peak versus time delay, and you can see clear oscillations of the position of the peak. And this is due to uh, expansion and contraction of the crystal uh, uh, responding to the excitation by the laser at, uh, at uh, t equals zero. And the understanding of that comes from this uh, uh, theoretical idea that when you, when you excite a metal with a laser, you generate a lot of electrons and the uh, electron temperature jumps up very, very high in the first uh, uh, femtosecond uh, uh, time scale. Um, and then over the course of about a picosecond, that couples to the crystal lattice 
and then the two temperatures of the crystal lattice and the electrons equilibrate uh, uh, towards each other. So what you get is a heating, but what's special about this is that the electrons travel very fast through the crystal, and so the heating is going to be uniform everywhere inside the crystal, and that's why you get this instantaneous breathing mode of the crystal expanding and contracting. I was, when we did the experiment, I was expecting the opposite to happen, so I was completely wrong. Um, and we also get these co coherent diffraction patterns from every shot of the uh, free electron laser, and so we can watch not only the oscillation of the peak position, but we can watch the internal strain pattern change at the same time as a function of time delay during the, uh, uh, during the experiment. And the understanding of the oscillations um, is that there is um, we're looking in a one-on-one -on -one direction. The shape of the crystal is roughly a cylinder where the radial direction has a, a, a mode of vibration associated with it and the axial direction has a mode. They have two different frequencies and they beat together to give this sort of beat pattern that you can see very well in the, in the uh, peak position versus, uh, versus delay here. So we can see the, vib the breathing modes of the crystal very well. And then we can go further and, and in addition to seeing the breathing modes, we can look at the internal structure of the crystal and how that changes with time. And that's, uh, actually I'll skip over this. Um, and that's shown here. So we see this pattern of maxima and minima, uh, outward and inward uh, compression of the crystal, again projected onto the 111 uh, uh, Bragg peak uh, direction. We can see this pattern uh, clearly vibrating, uh, it's an internal mode of, of vibration. And if we uh, model this, we can get uh, agreement with um, uh, one of the shear modes of vibration, which is called a 1-1 one -one, uh, mode of a cylinder. And you can see that the pattern that we see in our experiment um, agrees quite well with a simple model for, for the vibration expected of a, uh, of a cylinder. So I think we've got that fairly well, uh, fairly well understood. Okay, so then we go on to the part where we're into new territory and perhaps seeing something very interesting and new, and that is what happens when we change the, uh, the fluence of the laser. We turn up the power of the laser and we can turn it up to the point that we can completely destroy the crystal. Um, in fact, the, we did try and do a fourth power level, but uh, we didn't have a sample anymore, so we didn't get any data. Um, but we've got three different uh, uh, increases of the laser uh, fluence uh, on the same, uh, the same gold nanocrystal. And you can see a few time delays here. You can see this oscillation of the peak position going, uh, uh, going across as a function of time delay. And as we increase the fluence, the oscillations get bigger and uh, also the shape of the peak starts to change. Particularly here, uh, 50 picoseconds after, after the laser, we get this very broad peak that's uh, uh, change shape enormously from the starting uh, position and also um, also from from the uh, uh, from the lower fluences. So we've got a, a particular unusual behaviour going on here. Um, <coughs> the uh, um, the if we track that behaviour, we can see it uh, here. This is showing time delay on the axis here, and then the peak shift going up here. And the lowest power level, we see the oscillations. Higher power, we see bigger oscillations, and bigger still at the third power level. And they start to get flat, showing that there's something uh, unusual uh, starting to happen. And if we look at the width of the peak, then it explodes, uh, particularly at this 50 picosecond point, where, the, oscillation, where the, the width of the peak is oscillating as well, but it gets suddenly much, much bigger when we, when we get to this third uh, fluence level. And because we've got these coherent diffraction patterns, we can also invert those and get images of the crystal. And these show the images that, uh, that come out. Again, the same panels as, uh, as previously. And this one that we were highlighting down here at 50 picoseconds, the crystal has shrunk to uh, uh, about half the, uh, half the diameter that, uh, that it started at. And notice that this is a oscillatory behavior. The experiment is repeated over and over again, so this is a a, uh, a repetitive behavior that we're seeing. And what we attribute this to is actual melting of the exterior of the crystals. The crystal doesn't disappear 
to get smaller. It just disappears from the Bragg condition by melting. And so what we, what we think we have is transient melting for about 100 picoseconds or so, where the outside of the crystal, where the, in the vibration picture, the uh, spacing between the atoms is, uh, uh, is, uh, is at its biggest. Uh, that reaches the melting point on the outside and disappears from the diffraction, but then 50 picoseconds later it comes back again and recrystallizes back into the crystal and then repeats over and over again. So we can begin to understand this, uh, this uh, uh, <coughs> um, quasi-melting behavior that I alluded to at the beginning of the talk. Uh, we're, we're starting to get some understanding of that. And obviously we need to do a lot more experiments to, uh, uh, to get to the bottom of what's really, uh, really going on. Okay, so I'm going to stop. Um, I've told you that we can... Um, no, no, it's, it's not the end. This is the end. Um, I've told you that we can, um, we can get these complex density patterns which we can use to image strains inside crystals. The strain is fundamentally coupled to the shape of the crystal through the, this uh, Gibbs-Thompson idea. I've shown you um, that we can look at uh, crystal growth and we can see the role of dislocations taking place in the crystal growth of, of uh, calcite. I've shown you the new direction that we're going to be going in. Seeing these phase domains, we need to get uh, full understanding of what the phase domains are, are caused by and what their consequence is in the, in the, um, in the transport properties of the, of the uh, correlated electron materials that we're looking at, and that needs low temperature. Um, and then we've seen uh, snapshot imaging of vibrations inside crystals done with an XFEL, and then last of all, this uh, transient melting behavior. So I'm going to stop there, and I uh, hope you're going to have some questions. All right, questions for Ian? Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. Nice talk, Ian. Um, I have, I'm curious about the, the gold nanoparticle melting at the end. So um, perhaps you could describe how are the gold crystals being held and is the reversibility, did you see that from the beginning? I would imagine if you're actually melting that the first time you melted it, it might have reformed into a different shape and then it would be reversible after that initial thing. I mean, is, is, did you see something like that? Yes. Uh, well, we don't see it because we can only do an experiment which is in this stroboscopic mode where you, we need to average a thousand shots to get each of the diffraction patterns. And each of those shots has got the excitation coming before it. So what we're seeing is the, uh, whatever survives, the first shot is going to do something different and it gets into a, into a, a state which is, which is repetitive and, uh, and, and that's what we're imaging only. Um, so we're only able to do that. And we have tried to estimate um, temperatures that, that, that are involved. There's an eight millisecond spacing between the shots, which is given by LCLS. And there is, there is an average heating, which we think is a few hundred degrees, just of, of, of both the beams hitting it, which raise it to a few hundred degrees. And then each shot brings it another few hundred degrees that, that relaxes back again. Uh, again, very rough estimates based on the thermal expansion that, that, we, uh, that, that we see. Um, and both, both beams are contributing to that. So both the laser beam and the X-ray beam are contributing to the, uh, to the overall heating. And the, uh, the highest fluence that we reached does very roughly do, does correspond to the, uh, the standard melting point of gold. So, so we are in the region of, of, of bulk melting for, for the peak. And so what we're seeing, what we're imaging, is the, is the distribution of the melt uh, that occurs uh, on, on each cycle. Are, are, they, are these mounted just on like oxide substrates or whatnot? I'm yep. just kind of curious yep. whether there's a... Yep. Uh... Yeah, they're, they're just sitting there. Um, we've, we've developed a, a method of preparing them uh, where um, we can see in the SEM that they're actually buried partly under the surface. So they're sitting in little pockets. Um, and uh, that, we think, helps keep them in place during this uh, you know, exposure to a lot of excitation. And they don't all survive. We, we have to look at a few to find one that works. But, uh, uh, but this, uh, uh, by growing them on SiO2 substrates, where the, the oxide grows up around the crystal, 
uh, seems, to, seems to be a good way of holding them in place. Oh, I have a question about the, you talk about you're planning to do the uh, CDI, BRAC CDI for those kind of chart ordering, orbit ordering. Yes. And, uh, you know, because those chart ordering, orbit ordering, so it's a showing definitely not a primary BRAC peak, it's like superstructure P. But those usually, the intensity is very low. It's like a few yeah. order lower than the main pr yeah. primer. That's right. That's the first thing. Second thing is uh, those domain size of no matter charge ordering, orbit ordering, spin ordering, they're very small. It's like 20, 30, 40 nanometer. Because so far, the, your technique uh, applied to gold or whatever is like a couple hundred. So, you know, you think it's going to be a big challenge in SS2? Um, or only can be done after APS upgrade? Well, I can answer both questions, uh, but not from my own work. Um, and I just need to go back to the historical slide that I showed. Uh, where, where, where was it? Um, ah, sorry. I'm getting confused here. This one. Um, so, so this paper um, uh, was uh, 10 years ago, um, and um, you, you recognize some of the names here. The, the, this is uh, pedigree work, let's say. Um, and it was done on a beamline with a proper cryostat with, uh, with the ability to do this. And what they did to make the beam coherent was just to, uh, to, to put in a pinhole on an existing uh, large uh, sample. So, so this uh, diffraction pattern here, you can see the statistics are not very good, but it, it is still measured, and it took uh, a few hours to measure, but uh, uh, this, this is already on one of the superstructure peaks. And these patterns here, this is orbital ordering, this one is charge ordering, and these, uh, these are, are measurable uh, with um, a fairly long exposure. Um, and you can also see the answer to your question about the sizes. So the orbital ordering is the inverse of the size of this diffraction pattern. The uh, charge ordering is, is much bigger because the diffraction pattern is much smaller with fewer speckles in it. But uh, uh, the sizes are maybe three to one or something. So, so I th it, it's hard, but uh, it, it's doable. And um, on good samples, we can get a million counts per second in, in, uh, in, in a peak. So uh, I, think, I think we're going to be okay. The experiment um, looking at the laser uh, fluence, so it sounded very nice that you had figured out that the uh, initial excitation somehow with the transfer of the heat from the electrons yep. produced this rather simple uh, ex breathing modes, yep. ex expansion. But then and later you were showing that you eventually get non-symmetric modes, uh, higher order uh, modes than that. Is that if you start with a breathing mode and some funny shaped particle, does it then you know, reflect around off the surfaces and produce those other modes? Do you get to see it transition from one mode to a bunch of modes? Um, not yet. Uh, it, those are all very interesting things to, 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 to look at. And, and it is, uh, I think, correct that the, um, the heat pulse is likely to, to couple mainly to, to, to uh, breathing modes uh, in, in such a crystal. Um, <coughs> I didn't go into much detail, but there is a damping that we see. It's a relatively light damping compared with many other experiments, but uh, we can see about uh, uh, 30 or 40 oscillations or so of the vibration. Every time the oscillation gets smaller, it's because there's an impedance with the substrate or something around it that, that is imperfect. So energy is, is getting converted at the interface between the crystal and the supporting substrate. And perhaps that's how how some of it goes into these other vibration modes. Um, I don't think we were able to track the amplitude of the, of the internal shear mode uh, very well, uh, because we didn't have enough. Each one needed a full data set of 3D diffraction patterns. I don't think we have enough data to say if that one is building up and then going down. Um, uh, but it probably has been measured by laser spectroscopy. I, I just don't, don't have the example in my head. Um, because there's been, um, there, there have been, well, wait a minute, you, you, don't, you don't see those internal modes very easily, but it, it may have been done, anyway. Yeah. Any other questions for you? All right, let's thank our speaker one more time.